Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmers. Well, hello, Judy. Hello, viewers and listeners. Our topic for today is co-parenting with a narcissist or other difficult people. And that's an interview with Teresa Lodato. Uh, and you will see the interview. Uh, and she was a wonderful guest mm -hmm. and, and a real trooper because <laughs> what a folks, I'm, I'm going to, I, you don't, do you need to hear this? I'm nevertheless going to say, if you are a podcaster, uh, I'm going to put out publicly uh, and a complaint about Zencaster, which we just have started to try, it is incredibly unreliable. And I'm going to tell them I'm saying that publicly, and then we'll see if they'll give us our money back. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, we ended up getting a great, uh, really nice um, interview. It'll be worth watching just to see how I was able to piece it together. Uh, and, if we're able to piece it <laughs> oh, together. Oh, well, definitely. If, if you're watching this, it's because we were able to piece it together. That's so right. that's no problem. Uh, anyway, before we do that, we do want to put in a word for a few of our exciting developments around here, nice. starting with the books that, you know, the, the book that got this started and then some other books too. Right. Tell folks. Yes. The one that got it started is Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. And there it is. Uh, that's the book that started this all about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And then much more recently... It's not about communication, why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. That's a book that just came out as the, the time we're making this about four months ago. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where, you know, we're still, of course, promoting those and people are buying it. And I hope you'll uh, enjoy those. Mm -hmm. Since then, I have decided just because it's so doable mm -hmm. to do a bunch of sort of uh, shorter treatments of some things and put them out as booklets. Right. So there are two that are out already. One of them is called. Oh, oh, the seven, seven words, words to jumpstart your love life. Yes. Seven words to jumpstart your love life. And the other is called. My husband complains about my cleaning. What do I do? Hint, it's not about cleaning. Yeah. Now that one about my husband complains about my cleaning. Yeah. We just happen to have a paper bag version right over there. Um, whoops. There you go. And the paper bag version, <laughs> shall we juggle? Uh, that kind of day, folks. The, uh, the paper bag version of My Husband Complains is available on Amazon. Actually, they're both available on Amazon in any format you like. They are ebook. They are paperback, as you saw. They are uh, audio, audio, audio books as well. Mm -hmm. Having said that, don't buy seven words to jumpstart your love life. No, don't buy. You're telling people not to buy your I'm, book. And, and it's a damn good book, by the way. It's don't. It, so I'm not saying not to buy it. why you tell people not to buy it? Because I'll give it to you for free. Free? Yes, I will oh, give it to you for free. Now, Really? How do you get it for free? What a, what a great question. The way you get it for free is you buy, you know, all you have to do is sign up for Dr. Chalmers' newsletter. Ah. And how might you sign up for Dr. You Good can tell, question. You can how tell might you that. sign up for, oh, well, I have a, would it be, you go to our website, ctn7.com. And what happens when you go there is. You, you'll get a pop-up window. A, a, po a box magically appears that says, <laughs> click here to sign up for Dr. Chalmers' newsletter. Follow the directions. And all, you know, all I'll ask you for is your, you know, your email address. And I think all you really need is your first name. You can mm. give me more than that if you want to. Uh, and that's it. And that will sign you up for my mailing list. And then you will receive it. It's about twice a month that I've been doing the Dr. Chalmers newsletter. And it's really fun. I, I've been having fun writing it. I, you can speak to it. It's got great tips and insights and mm -hmm. all kinds of great stuff. And, you know, the occasional sort of quirky take on things. Yes, and, you know, it's quirky. just it's it's a fun read. Mm -hmm. And uh, also invites, of course, comment from folks. And I will have folks, you know, responses from people in there sometimes too. Uh, and that is just a way of getting you to think about these the stuff that we're doing here and spread the word so that other people get to find out about it. And, um, you know, that's how, <laughs> look, from an author, mm -hmm. why do I want to do that? So that people will get interested in my books and buy my books, right? Of course. Uh, and so, and I think they're good ideas too. Mm -hmm. And I think they're good ideas for the, well, I'd say that I suppose in any time we live in, but especially the times we live in mm -hmm. now. Uh, a lot of the ideas that I talk about, I think, are really important ideas, and I want to spread the word. So there's all of that. We also want to talk about our merch. We have, and I still forgot to bring up the tote bag. You know, one of these days, folks, keep watching this space because eventually I'll remember <laughs> to bring up the tote bag. Use it. 
So yeah, it's, you know, that's right. We use it all the time. It's near the front door. Yeah. Um, we have uh, the ones we're holding here for those of you watching this video are our Couples Therapy in Seven Words mugs in the beautiful 15 ounce and 11 ounce sizes, mm -hmm. uh, which have, you can describe them for folks right. who want to watch them. It has our it. beautiful heart shaped logo with the number seven in it. It says Couples Therapy in Seven Words. And on the other side is the motto of this podcast Be kind, don't panic, and have faith. And so you can uh, be drinking that and drinking your morning beverage out of that. And, and the tote bag, I really put it in for the tote bag, even though I keep forgetting to bring it. Mm -hmm. um, is, and t-shirts too. Uh, and t-shirts. We also have t-shirts. So you can announce to the world those really, I think, very useful ideas. Yes. And so without further ado, we will go to our rather pieced together uh, interview our with our, delightful our wonderful guest, guest, Teresa Lodato. And uh, you'll in I hope you'll enjoy that. And we will see you on the other side. Our guest today is Teresa Lodato. After 20 plus years in financial services, a rare and serious chronic stress-related illness ended it all. Teresa now combines science and awareness to help stressed out adults and teens get better results with less effort so they live purposeful and pain-free lives. Teresa is the author of Why Aren't You Listening to Me? Elevate Your Emotional Intelligence and Connect with Your Team. Teresa, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Oh, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. So how did you get into all this? Anyway, how did you get into the work you do? Tell us something about your, your journey that brought you to where you are now. Absolutely. You know, um, I worked in financial services, as you've heard from my bio, and uh, most recently I was in private banking and investments for a top Wall Street firm. And I was waking up at 345 in the morning, you know, to do the workday hustle, go to the gym, work out, because of course, you know, when you're stressed, everyone tells you work out and that'll relieve your stress. Well, I, I worked out every day. <laughs> And you can get up at 3.45 in the morning so you can relieve your stress, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, I'd work a long day and I'd have to leave work early because I had to go pick my son up from daycare. And long story short, all that buildup of chronic stress ended up uh, creating a condition called hemiplegic migraines. So it's migraines with stroke-like symptoms. Oh. Now, I've had migraines my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was something that I've constantly battled with. But... That was kind of a new one to me to develop that, and it, it ended my career. And at the time, I was in an ex oops, extremely difficult marriage with a difficult husband who we just had vastly different values. He had traditional values. I had contemporary. Uh, you know, he had very strict role expectations. And, you know, from what I know now, I, I think that he's an undiagnosed narcissist because there was tons of emotional and mental abuse in our relationship. And oh, so oh. everything combined just, um, I, you know, I joke, I say it just blew out all my circuits. You know, I just mm -hmm. there's nothing else I could do. And so my journey to healing led to me, number one, divorcing him, <laughs> but number two, uh, studying psychology in graduate school and then going on to get advanced certifications in neuroscience and relational trauma. And I think with all the knowledge and the understanding, you know, I did it initially to heal myself, to understand myself and to try to figure out how did I, how did I get here? You know, I'm a smart, strong, successful woman. You know, I've, you know, I've, I've done things in my life, you know, 20 years in financial services and been successful. That's not easy for a woman to do, you know, it's mm -hmm. a man's world. And, you know, to have found myself where I was literally crippled by these stroke-like symptoms, uh, was really kind of a wake-up call for me. And so as I progressed along my healing journey, you know, I first thought, okay, I'll be a, I'll be a therapist, you know, I'll do like what you do. And I realized, wow, that, you know, that I, I think I'd end up burning out eventually from that as well. And uh, one of my professors in graduate school said, have you thought about coaching? You'd make a fantastic coach as well. He said, mm -hmm. we, you know, our, our profession will totally miss you, but you know, hey, and so I got into coaching and I remember the first day of coach mm -hmm. training, just feeling like, oh my gosh, I am exactly where I am meant to be. You mm -hmm. know, like all those, you know, all the ways that I was following my heart along my healing journey and doing different things. You know, I became a crew and a Reiki master. I became, you know, I started volunteering in hospitals and hospice with Reiki and, 
you know, when I started doing intuitive work and I did dream work um, in graduate school and all of those things, it didn't really make sense to me, you know, and my family would say, why are you doing this, Teresa? And I said, you know, I don't know. My heart is just telling me this is what I need. And through that process of listening to my heart, it led me to where I am. And so that's, that, that's why it was so critical that first day of coach training, all these random dots, you know, you're a statistician, all these random dots all of a sudden made sense and they like aligned perfectly. And ever since I made that connection, being able to help other high achieving women, uh, especially that are stressed out, who maybe are suffering from relational trauma in their marriage or their partnerships or family or workplace, it's just, it's something that I'm so passionate about and it's so fulfilling mm. to me. So that's how I got to where I am today. Uh -huh. Indeed. You know, I'm curious to follow up a little more because I know you told us you had done a blog post about the very issue of how do you co-parent with somebody who is, and you, you described, you know, not to say any bad things about particular people, but you yeah. have encountered, let's say, people who would have a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder or just generally difficult folks. Yeah. And it sounds like you have some hard-won expertise around that. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, my, one of my mentors, uh, who I actually got my relational trauma certification through, um, did, started doing a blog specifically about narcissism and toxic personality types. And she asked me because she knew that I had experience co-parenting with a toxic person. And she asked me to write the blog post. And, um, you know, it's been something that I think people have found incredibly useful. Um, it's been picked up by a couple different places already, and it's only been out for about six months. Uh, but I think it's, you know, co-parenting is, is, can be challenging enough, you know, for two people that are healthy and that oh, have yeah. their best interests for their child at heart. But when you throw in that extra level of difficulty with someone who just is difficult, who's unhappy, who's insecure at their core and they don't realize it, mm -hmm. then it becomes extremely challenging. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I wrote that blog post to kind of give people, you know, five to seven tips on what to do so that you can navigate that relationship because it's, it's you know, I think of co-parenting, it's about the kids. It's all about the kids. It's about ourselves and, and the opportunity to heal as well. But if nothing else, it's about the kids and making sure that they're taken care of. Yeah, I like the term you used. You had BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Oh, is it listen actively, ask good questions? Well, my, I, you know, I thought that was really good, but how could you give us an example of when you're dealing with somebody who has a toxic personality? You said it's always good to make them feel they have the upper hand. So <laughs> what would an example be of giving them, um, making them feel like they have the upper hand? Great question. You know, a lot of times we get caught up in our own ego and so it's more about proving to the other person that, no, I'm right. And so mm -hmm. there, that becomes this clashing. And in any relationship, I think it's important, you know, to active listen and be curious. But especially with a toxic personality type, when you take the approach of just neutral, number one, you're not giving that person anything to push up against. So you're not really feeding them with the kind of energy that they want. You know, they're looking for a reaction. They're looking for a way to have control or to feel like they have control over you. And so when you are neutral and you just ask curious questions, then it becomes less about a competition. And I think it really, you know, in my experience, my clients' experiences and, you know, other therapists that I know who deal with this as well, we all agree that it tends to put people who are difficult kind of off guard. And that's really where you, where you want someone who's really difficult to be. You don't want them to have the upper hand. And the well, other it's interesting. That, that idea of off guard is an interesting way of saying it because a lot of times when someone is on guard, they are in offensive mode. Yes. And if you can inv if you can inquire into someone's experience rather than oppose them, right. they will often then relax their guard yeah. and then it's not so much of a fight and then you exactly. can actually get somewhere. It's, it's always I've always found that fascinating in dealing with couples that 
one of the things it takes to to be able to be generous, which either generous or assertive, either one, but Mm -hmm. to be able to come to an agreement with someone with whom you start off disagreeing, you actually have to be very secure in your own sense of validity, which of course folks with, you know, as you're describing it, toxic personalities Mm -hmm. aren't. (laughs) That's the problem. So, the, yeah, the, you know, that idea of BATNA, that yeah, best yeah. alternative, I, I hadn't encountered that term before, before we saw it in your blog post. And it was a fascinating idea. Can you can you give an example of that? Like, how do you decide, well, all right, if you can't come up with a negotiated agreement, what's the best alternative? And so when you think about BATNA, you know, the best alternative to a negotiated um, agreement, you're thinking, like, with my ex-husband, I was always looking it was like a chess match trying to figure out, okay, where is he going? Where, what is his end goal? What is he looking to achieve? And then I would back it up and I'd say, okay, what am I willing to compromise on in order to make that happen? Like what, where am I, where can I give him something? I guess compromise is the wrong way or word, but where would I be willing to give to make him feel like he wins? Because for people that are difficult, they want to win. That's that's their big thing. And so even if something, and this is something that um, my husband's ex-girlfriend, we share a child with her, and she too is a toxic personality type. And, you know, it's it's really, everything is about, even if it's in the child's best interest, to anyone, if you asked any random person on the street, is this the right thing for the child? They would say, yeah, that's the right thing. But if a difficult person is trying to win, they'll just blow right past that. And so when I think of examples, um, I think about, uh, oh, for example, um, when we were going through mediation, uh, there's been a few times that I've had to renegotiate our child custody agreement uh, with my ex-husband. And one of the sticking points was he had taken out an insurance policy. And in the initial custody agreement, we had agreed that I would get a certain amount of life insurance if first, like I'd be the primary person if something happened to him so that I could take care of our child. Sure. Well, you know, as our son got older, now he's 18 and getting ready to go off to college. A couple of years ago, when we had to renegotiate the contract because my ex-husband was making so much money, you know, I had to give on that. You know, that was something it's like, OK, if, if you don't want to pay me what the, you know, the, we've agreed on paying in, as far as support in order to keep our child comfortable and where, you know, his his way of living, then I'll give on the life insurance. And so I ended up giving up half the life insurance just so he could feel like he won. Mm-hmm. And that's what ended up sealing the deal. I mean, we were going back and forth with our mediation attorney you know, probably for months and wasted you know, quite a bit of money. But it's it's always one of these things where you have to think, what would you be willing to give up that's that doesn't really affect you so mm-hmm. that they can have a win, even if it's something small, like life insurance. I mean, I was in financial services. Most people don't end up needing life insurance. They need disability insurance, lots of disability <laughs> insurance. You're more likely to become disabled than that. So, you know, that was something I was willing to give on. And um, yeah. anyway. Yeah, it's interesting, sort of in order to negotiate with someone who doesn't have a lot of ego strength, uh, you know, which, which you know, paradoxically makes them incredibly difficult to deal with because they won't give on anything. You have to be able to have enough ego strength to give yourself to some extent say, okay, well, I don't have to define myself by winning here the way the other person is doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, And one of the other things that you write about is a spiritual connection. Um, And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, um, Dr. Lisa Miller is, oh, let's see, she's at Columbia and she is a psychologist and she worked with, is it Yale? Yale and Columbia did a, a joint study where they wanted to study the spiritual connection that people have in relation to depression and anxiety, suicide, et cetera. And she really came up with these fantastic statistics. People that are in touch or have a spiritual connection, and and spiritual connection could be anything. It could be religion. It could be choice of no religion. It could just feel like you're connected with something larger than yourself. Mm -hmm. But the people who had that spiritual connection were something like, 75% less likely to develop depression. If you're at risk for depression, the 
rate went up to 92%. Um, Mm -hmm. And then, you know, she went on as far as like reducing the relative risk of suicide was something like 82%. I mean, really, really high numbers. And one of the things that I took away from that was the same thing that I experienced in my own healing journey. The closer I got aligned with myself, the closer I searched myself for who I am authentically. Um, You know, a lot of times people that have experienced trauma in their lives are become people pleasers. And so they're always giving and they, and they don't really know what they want in their lives. You know, you ask them, well, what would make you feel better? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. The more we can get to know ourselves and really align with that part of ourselves that is so much deeper, that is below all the masks of the ego. Mm-hmm. When we're in alignment with that, then decisions become easier because we're able to set healthy boundaries. If we know our values, then it's easy for us to say, yeah, no to this or yes to this, because if we're aligned with those values, it's crystal clear. But so many of us who experience chronic stress and, you know, especially because of past trauma, it can be challenging to do that. And I think that's where the lines really get blurred. And so it's really, really important, especially when you're dealing with someone who is so insecure, who's so based in fear as someone who is a difficult personality type, it's really important that we be as clear as we can be. It's almost like being the adult in the room in a yeah. sense. You, you know, know it's, it's how, can, how can I access all of my brain? You know, when you talk about stress, that's cutting off your uh, access to higher levels of executive functioning. So bringing our brain back into balance, that balanced Goldilocks state that Dr. Amy Arnston talks about, being able to do that allows us access to everything that our brain can offer us, the higher levels of executive functioning, the memories, uh, the intuitive guidance that we all have naturally within us. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, and even it's not that something sense, Even that sense of connection with something larger, I, I think... I often bring up Jill Bolte-Taylor in this context. Uh, mm-hmm. She's the neuroscientist who had a stroke. I don't know if you're familiar yes. with her. Yeah, yeah, a stroke of a stroke of uh, um, insight. Um, a stroke of insight was her TED insight. talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my what? Yes, my I think of my stroke of insight. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm spacing out on it, but yes. <laughs> but and her her more recent book, Whole Brain Living, <clears> talks <throat> a lot about we're all four different people. And yes. at, I, I can't resist throwing in, you know, the, our, the title of our podcast here, Couples Therapy in Seven Words, derives the motto that I made up many years ago, mm-hmm. uh, sort of summarizing, well, what is couples therapy all about? Well, the seven words are be kind, don't panic, and have faith. And they fit together, much as you were describing, when you have faith, and, and I'm, I use faith very similar to how you talk right, about spiritual Right, not necessarily connection. a religious faith, but faith in faith. It, yeah. yeah, the mindset yeah. that, that reality is right to be what it is. Yes. That that is the antidote to panic, you know, mm-hmm. the, being overwhelmed with fear. So you do have your whole brain available so that you can then be kind. And I don't just mean nice to people, but kind in the sense of radical acceptance of kinship, recognizing, okay, we're all in this together. Yeah. That that phenomenon and spiritual connection is a lot about it. I also want to throw in, it's funny because I was just writing about this recently. The um, When you talk about the research on does spiritual connection improve things like, you know, uh, susceptibility to depression and things like that. I wrote a study like that back in 1978, I believe, <laughs> when I was a statistician. I was working on a, uh, at the um, Vermont Regional Cancer Center, it was called at the time. It was relatively new then. And I was doing, uh, working on a study as the statistician, a study of whether nurse home visits improve the quality of life of patients with a terminal diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And they, I did a stu- part of it. The, what I wrote was religion in patients with advanced cancer. Now, religion is sort of a proxy for spirituality, but <clears throat> you know, roughly similar, and found a very similar result. It was one of hundreds of studies that have now, or at least dozens of studies. I, I saw a compendium of them not long ago. Mm. Uh, that mine, mine wasn't in there, but they didn't go back far enough. Um, <laughs> but they had dozens of studies from like the, the 80s, 90s, and you know, 2000s. Um, that were confirming those same results, that a mindset of faith is the antidote to the sort of things that are represented by panic, you know, that depression and suicidality and things like that. Yeah, well, and it just, it makes sense, doesn't it? You mm-hmm. know, if you if you have faith in something larger, if you believe, if you have that growth mindset and you have that faith that 
things will get better or this too will pass, my grandmother always used to say. Mm -hmm. And if you can find even that little bit of hope, that's going to calm your body down. That's going to calm your nervous system down. That's going to reset your brain to a certain extent, or at least bring it up back into balance to some extent to where you have more access to that executive functioning, to, you know, the different networks in your brain. So, you know, it's, I love studies. I love being able to point to something that says, here, this is this, you know, they actually studied this and this is what they found. However, there's so much that we just, is, is common sense almost to a certain extent. You know, there's this an intuition that we all share communally that, you know, uh, you know, when I talk about in my upcoming book, Becoming Charmed, you know, when I talk about time, for me, it seems just natural to talk about cycles of time. Well, it just seems natural to align ourselves when our energy is naturally high. So to do the really difficult tasks when our body naturally has a lot of energy and to do when our bodies have naturally lower energy, it just seems to make common sense to rest, allow our body to rest, not have difficult conversations, not try to argue with your partner or to debate something at that point in time. You know, so much I have found is really kind of common sense, but who is it? Um, is it Will Rogers that said common sense isn't necessarily common? I forget Something who like said that. It, but. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, because um, it's actually one of the provisional titles we had for this, and we may change it after the conversation, but one of the provisional titles we had for this picked up on something you talked about, the seven keys to living a life you love. And I wonder if you want to kind of, maybe you've already done so or something, but you could identify like, what are the seven keys? What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, the seven keys, you know, given my studying of psychology and neuroscience and then just, you know, human relationships throughout my life, um, one thing that really has come to me is, you know, number one, the more aware you become, the the better, you know, you the more aware you become of yourself, that you become of your traumas, that you become of how you are holding your emotions, um, just awareness in general is huge, which is why my company is named Becoming Aware. Um, but what I really tied in with is these elements of time and discernment and awareness and how they overlap. I almost see it like a giant Venn diagram. You know, when you have discernment, when you are aware of the stories that you're telling yourself, your beliefs and your expectations, and you combine that with awareness, becoming aware of the stories you're telling yourself and how they're impacting your life, then you can develop trust. So there are three keys right there. When you talk about um, the stories you tell yourself and time, you start thinking about things like how your limiting beliefs and stress can interact. And when you put those two keys together, when you master those two keys, you end up with freedom. Because when you realize that you've got time and that, you know, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm aware of these limiting beliefs, it's almost like it breaks those bonds of slavery. You know, you're not being held by those unconscious beliefs you have. Mm -hmm. And then if you combine awareness with time, then you get agency. If you're aware of what's going on in your life, then you are more empowered to do things, you know, to take steps to to recognize that if you're dealing with a difficult person, you have a choice in the matter. You may not be able to change the other person. And quite frankly, I think that's the number one problem in relationships is everyone is trying to change the other. <laughs> or the Broadway show, I, I love you, you're perfect, now no change. change right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, those expectations we have of, around others, um, you know, is it destroys relationships. If But the more aware we become and realize that we don't have to change the other, what we can do is work on changing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we can all work on changing ourselves since that gives us agency. And then when you combine all of those six keys together, it creates creation. Because when you have mastered all of those keys, then you can create the life that you love. And, you know, it's it's something that um, I used to have this uh, little block of wood and it said, happiness is a journey, not a destination. And I love that. I that I, yeah. it said, well, it, <laughs> well, R says life is a journey, not a destination. Yeah, and it, but it is. It's, 
you know, when you when you think about it, so many people are thinking, oh, well, when I lose weight, oh, everything will be great. Or right. when I find a man, everything will be great. Or when I get a wife, everything will be great. Uh-huh. And we forget that it's about the journey. And so even when it comes to these seven keys, even if even if you get to the point where you can master all seven keys, and quite frankly, you know, I'm writing the book, but I haven't even completely mastered. I'm not perfect. I'm we still learning. I'm still project. growing. Yeah. yeah. And but but having a handle, having the awareness of these seven keys and being able to actively work on them mm-hmm. is how you create the life you love. You know, I can this is how I can be in a wonderful marriage with uh, an emotionally intelligent husband who's kind and supportive and generous and, you know, just the the kind of person, uh, kind of healthy relationship that I think we all long to be in. Mm. And yet we can both still deal with our difficult exes. And right. when when you're in that place that you know, <laughs> even when the exes are doing their crazy things, I can remember um, on Valentine's Day one year, my husband and I had to go down to the court because his ex-girlfriend was suing us. And so, you know, for more child support. And so it's like we were able to even make that a wonderful experience and something that bonded us closer together rather than breaking us apart. And I think that's the real key of the seven keys is when you are actively in that space and working on all of these things and just making it about the journey, then anything you do, even if it's really stressful and even if it's a day that's set away, you know, set apart for love or for something else, you can still have fun and you can still have that relationship get stronger. And I think that that's one of the takeaways with co-parenting is that, you know, so many times with co-parents, you know, one parent generally feels like uh, the other parent is the fun parent, you know, and it's stereotypically the the woman, you know, that is feels like she has to work more and, oh, well, the husband, you know, the ex-husband, he just gets to play with the kids. Mm-hmm. Not always the case, but stereotypically. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you have the, you have the power within yourself to create your own life to be fun as well, because resentment to me isn't anger. Resentment to me is feeling left out or, or feeling like your needs aren't being met. And yeah. so it's like, okay, if, if you are resenting your ex because they're having so much fun with their kids, how about what can you do in your own life to change that, to maybe shift your perspective? You know, instead of working all the time and feeling the weight of the responsibility, how can we lower your stress levels so that you can have fun with your kids so that you don't resent your ex-husband because he's the fun parent, because now all of a sudden you're the fun parent, too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's just different ways. I think life is really about perspective. Yeah. It's so interesting when you're describing the seven keys. I don't know if you had this thought. We had, it, it comes up a lot in our in our conversations. We're Jewish and I'm, I am in no way an expert on Kabbalah. I have to put that out right off. But when you were describing seven, I was thinking the seven sefirot, you know, uh-huh. it, it, the, it sounded like Kabbalah to me. Do you have any, any background in that or any, you know, do you know what Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism is? I do. Yes. I, I, I know what it is. Um, I know I studied world religions and I know the Kabbalah is beautiful. That's, you know, the limited exposure I've had. Um, you know, if, if I wasn't raised Catholic, I think I'd probably choose to be Jewish just because it's such a beautiful religion. And, um, but no, I, I, beyond that, I don't know, um, much about the Kabbalah, but I'd love to. When you were talking about, first of all, just talking about discernment, and knowledge and you know understanding. I was thinking Chabad actually, mm-hmm. but I was also thinking about how when you combine them all together, you get creation. Mm-hmm. Boy, that sounds like something a Kabbalist would say. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I say I'm not I'm not well that well versed in it, but I'm not either. yeah, we we we're well versed in a lot of stuff Jewish, but not so much that part. Uh, but that just it's fascinating. And of course, seven, it had to be seven. You know, it's got to be seven. Right? seven. Well, that's why I have a seven a word. Seven's you know, number. Seven is right. like a. It's like. And it, it works actually neurologically seven works well because mm-hmm. it's the number of things you can perceive without having to count more oh, or less. Interesting. Well, yeah. you know, what, yeah. here's a little tidbit. It might be a little too much information, but um, I was born the seventh day of the seventh month of the 70th year on the seventh year of my parents' wedding anniversary on the seventh floor of the hospital. I weighed seven pounds and seven ounces and altogether <laughs> there. Altogether, there are seven sevens. Seven has been my number That's my entire number. life. Number. There you go. 
<laughs> and so when even when this, you know, the idea of the seven keys came to me, it didn't occur to me until I shared it with my husband and my sister. And they were like, well, of course you would come up with seven. Seven is your number. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Well, are there other things you'd like us to be asking you about? Uh, you know, it's really what is in the interest of your audience. You know, I, I think uh, co-parenting is something that I'd be happy to talk more about if mm -hmm. if you feel like that would be of interest to your audience. Well, I think and what you've already talked about, I think, is is uh, really relevant. It's very relevant to our audience because, you know, we're, we're a couples therapy you know, I'm the couples therapist and, and Judy, of course, is an educator, but I like to say she's the real person, you know, <laughs> the couples therapist and she's the actual human being. And, and well, I'm, I'm the nerd and she's the non-nerd, you know, so she, she translates what, you know, my nerdiness into something that people can actually I understand. I try to keep him on track when he gets off on these. <laughs> I, can get, I think you saw that happen there a little bit, right? I can get nerdy. But um, no, I think you've, uh, what you've been talking about has been very relevant because, you know, couples therapy often, I, of course, I see this in the office all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. couples who are dealing with exes or dealing with co-parenting issues. And and often, uh, often, I don't know if that's true, but not infrequently, I'm dealing with divorced spouses who are working on co-parenting issues because I do some of that as well for folks. I don't do mediation per se, but I certainly have helped, you know, and, and parents who are in the process of splitting up who are dealing with co-parenting issues. So yeah, the stuff you're talking about is, is very relevant. How can people uh, get in touch with you and learn more about what you offer? Give it, tell us your Absolutely. websites and stuff like that. Yeah, the website is my name, Teresa Lodato, and that's T-E-R, not T-H, um, mm -hmm. TeresaLodato.com. And um, I do a lot of speaking events and uh, workshops and whatnot. So pretty soon I'm actually, uh, I had watched a prior podcast of yours where you had updated your website uh, last year. And um, and that's actually what I'm going through right now is my website is being updated and released. So uh -huh. next month, when it finally goes live, uh, it will list, you know, the different opportunities for people to attend workshops or, you know, to listen in, you know, hear the different interviews I do or when I have speaking events to be able to attend those if they'd like to have more information. Well, we will be sure to put that uh, Teresa Lodato .com in our in the notes for this uh podcast for people who are seeing us, um, well, and hearing us, <laughs> look in the notes. That's where you'll be able to find that link. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Well, we hope you enjoyed meeting Teresa as much as we did. A lot of great things to say about dealing with difficult personalities and and, and enjoyable. Lord knows yeah. many of us have dealt with <laughs> difficult personalities. Indeed. And uh, she was, yeah, was a lot of fun to talk to and had a real trooper getting yeah, through our technical issues. Sport. And um, so if you have, uh, this is your, this is your cue. Ah, yes. yes. So if, you, <laughs> well, actually we didn't have a, we didn't have, we a, didn't listener have a listener question today, question but sometimes we, we do. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes we do take listener questions. We did not have one that we felt that, um, that was in uh, Teresa's field of expertise. But if you have a listener question that you would like us to discuss on the air, you can go to ctn7.com and you can write to us. Indeed. And of course, even just to suggest a topic, if there's a particular topic That's true. you'd like we us to see. We have gotten uh, suggestions for topics mm -hmm. in the past. So if you have a suggestion or if you would like to suggest somebody that we could interview or if you yourself would like to be interviewed, you can do all of that at ctn7.com. That's C-T-I-N number seven dot com. And indeed, uh, when you go to ctn7.com, that's where you'll also have access to all of our past episodes. This one uh, was, I believe this is number 116. Mm. We've been doing this for a while. And, we have. And, and it's still fun. Yeah, we're still having years. fun. We're still <laughs> having a good time. Before I break in, we what was the name of that too. song? Yeah, we're still having fun. You're Ain't still we the one. Got fun? Well, oh, there's no, that's that one a different too. one. Yeah. Still we're still having fun. And you're, you're still, still the one. one. Yeah, right. I don't, I don't remember who that was. Believe it or not, we can both sing. We can't sing it because Oh, that we'd have to pay royalties. That's right. Yeah, if you did, yeah. But I mean, believe it or not, we could both carry a tune. We didn't just show it right then, but we can both do that. Uh, neither one of us did right then. Um, so yes, please. Uh, and tell folks about this uh, podcast as yes. well. And don't forget the merch we talked about in the right. uh, intro so as well. Folks, share us, talk about us on social media, yep. follow, you know, all those things that people do. Absolutely. And also 
check out my books. Uh, the original book that got this whole business started, which is... Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. And then the more recent book, the um, the book-length book, which is... Yeah, it's not about communication. Why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. That's meant to be a provocative title, folks. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> in fact, I invite people in one of my invitations to my newsletter, which I'll talk about in just a second, uh, I often, I have been saying... You know, you might want to argue with that title. Of course, to do that, you'd probably have to read the book, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> check it out. Uh, but it's it's uh, it is meant to be a thought provoking title. And I've been uh, I've been churning out the books uh, and and booklets, I should say. I've decided nice. I'm doing some shorter ones. Right. Um, the two that Judy is holding shorter. up right now. Shorter. One of them is called Seven Words to Jumpstart Your Love Life. That's this one. That's that one. If you're for those watching, that's the freebie. That and I'll talk about that in just a second. And the other one is called. My husband complains about my cleaning. What do I do? Yeah. Hint, it's not about cleaning. It's not about cleaning. No, it's, it's, both of those are about relationships. You'll notice those are, they both seem much more specific, you know, than my more general, uh, larger books because they are, but they are, they're really, um, applying a lot of the same principles. They're applying the seven words. That's really what this is mm-hmm. all about in, in different ways. And as Judy mentioned, one of them, the seven words one, you don't have to buy it. That's right. I'm giving it away. All you have to do to get a hold of a the full color PDF, by the way, I'm not giving you a hard copy for nothing. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not spending money on you, but I'm giving you a freebie. All right, that's that's what I'm doing. Um, and well worth it. and well worth it. A uh, full color PDF. Uh, if you just sign up for my newsletter, sign up for Dr. Chalmers' newsletter. It's called, and you you can do that right from ctn7.com. Go there, you'll see a box appear that says "Click here to sign up for Dr. Chalmers' newsletter." So for a crying out loud, do that. By golly. So, until next time, remember, be kind, don't panic, and have faith.